Well, the workplace remains with elements that are very much in flux at the moment. We've seen people switching jobs at record levels over the last couple of years. And, of course, uh, remote work remains a component of the workplace now and most likely in the future. But what should we expect as we head into 2024? Matthew Bidwell is professor of management here at the Wharton School, and he joins us to kind of go over and give us some ideas on what he thinks may play out. Great to see you, Matthew. Good to see you, too. Let me before we talk about 2024, let's just look at 2023 first. And realistically, what do you think are the main takeaways when you think about the workplace and and, and careers and the labor force? Glad you're asking me about 2023 first, mainly because we know that experts do no better at predicting the future than anybody else. So <laughs> I think I can give you a good rundown on what happened 2024. It's anybody's guess. But let's start with 2023. I think of 2023 as being the year where one interesting thing happened and two interesting things didn't. Right. So the interesting that happened, um, the labor market cooled down. And so we saw 2021 and 2022 genuinely historic levels of attrition, genuinely historic levels of job openings. It was a huge hiring binge. It was very hard for employers to find people. They poached anybody that they could get. Huge amounts of mobility, like you said, particularly for um, hourly workers. For an employer, this was a nightmare. If you were the Fed, this was a problem because you were worrying about wage inflation. If you're an employee, and particularly one with, say, a high school education, so these employees have been overlooked in the labor market, it was a fantastic couple of years. Um, 2023, things cooled down. When you look at the aggregate statistics, we're back to 2019. And I remember being in here chatting to you in 2019 and we're saying, well, since it's an overheating hot labor market, and <laughs> yes. things are very tight and employees <laughs> have to think more. So, I mean, it's still, you know, we're not in recession by any stretch, but we're, we're back to something that people recognize as a little more normal. And in certain sectors, perhaps some of the ones that are craziest, so tech, particularly outside AI, you know, it's been a very marked slowdown. And so I think, that's the interesting thing that's happened. So some reversion, something looks like normal. Um, the two interesting things that didn't happen. Um, one, I think, is around remote work. Um, there was a huge amount of noise about return to office. Um, and you saw some high profile companies, particularly Amazon, some of the big banks. It's real kind of we're putting our foot down from now on. You're going to be back in the office. It gives the impression that we've seen kind of a decline in remote work. There are a couple of series of statistics that I look at to understand this. There's a wonderful survey that's done monthly by um, a team based in Stanford. Also, Castle Systems that do badge swipe data. They re release their back to work barometer um, weekly, kind of showing what's happening with office occupancy. They show basically a static picture all year. So while all the noise has been about return to office, you haven't seen an increase in office occupancy. It's stayed flat at around 50%. You know, wibbles up and down a little bit, down a bit in the summer, back up a bit afterwards. When you look at the surveys, it's the same. And so we've stayed where we were. I think we're still trying to negotiate what the future is going to look like. But increasingly, I think companies have kind of settled into a variety of different modes. Um, and I think in a way that is... Um, Pre-pandemic, we basically had a one-size-fits-all, like every company, you know, they might have a couple of people remote, but basically the normal is you're in the office five days a week. Um, I think compared to, so I remember talking about this with people last year, and I was saying, yeah, I could see three scenarios for remote work. So one is there's a recession, just everyone gets dragged back to the office. A second one is kind of a new normal where it's like three days a week in the office for everybody. And a third is kind of horses for courses, where kind of different companies have completely different policies depending on what works for them. I think we're moving towards that third, that third scenario. And so I think there's kind of been the aggregate statistics haven't changed, but I think there's been some clarification. And I think we're moving towards a world where different companies are settling into completely different policies and practices. So that's one thing that in a sense hasn't changed so much. The third thing, as you mentioned, AI. Um, it has seriously impacted a few jobs. So I think graphic designers have had a really rough year. Um, I think the people who have run these paper mills where they kind of sell essays to desperate um, college students, I think ChatGPT has devastated their business. I'm not so unhappy about that. But um, 
if you look at the average um, employee, it hasn't yet bitten, right? I mean, you know, I mean, there were there were some clearly ludicrous takes this time last year that, you know, within six months, various kinds of work will be dead. That was obviously wrong. I mean, I think it's what's happening is, like I said, all predictions are wrong. What's happening is reasonably predictable, which is it's happening slowly. Like, I, I think it could well have a big impact on many jobs but this year has been a year of people starting to figure out what's happening with it rather than wholesale implementation do you think then the impact will be complementary to the workers that are in the workplace or is there an element where you are still focused on how much it could take away like the leadership of companies see the benefits of ai they know how it can can save on the bottom line by by not having employees is, or is there a even a little bit of a combination of both of those i mean i i would have thought it's going to be both right i mean i you know everybody is saying it's not people or ai it's people with ai and right i'm sure that's true but you know if people with ai is a good solution ultimately you probably need fewer people right. for a lot of and so the question is when we have people with ai does it drive down the cost so much we can expand the market and hire more people or once we have people with AI, do we just need fewer people? And probably across different occupations, it's going to be different things. Yeah. Let me uh, go back to talking about remote work, because as this all started to develop, uh, we obviously had to have remote work because of the pandemic. And as the return to office was, was playing out, I, I just had the sense, and this is my opinion, uh, that we were eventually going to see, and it may be a longer period over time, that we will get back to pretty much everybody being back in the office. But it doesn't even seem like that's the case. Like companies have adjusted and they understand what kind of the new normal is. Uh, the voice of the employee maybe has a little bit more bite to it than it did back in 2019. What they want around remote work and these benefits obviously has a little bit more bite to it. Where do you think then remote work is kind of headed? I mean, the way I think about it, um, what COVID taught us, I mean, it just remote work was unimaginable, right? Pre, Pre-COVID, this idea that we could do most of our work staying home just didn't even occur to us, right? Then we do it and we can do most of our work. And I think what it made salient was the cost of coming into the office. Like, so a lot of people have a commute that's half an hour or an hour each way, right? So that's an hour or two hours of their day just to get into the office. Sure. Um, and so the question is, when are those costs worthwhile? And I think kind of the previous answer was every day you should be here. Right. Not really. I mean, there's a lot of work I get done as well. And in some cases, most people find that the kind of the focus work, the deep work, they do better at home. Yeah. Um, and so if most things I can do just as well and I don't have to incur an hour or two hours cost. Yeah. And by the way, that cost is not just mine. Right. That that is to some extent, coming out of my budget for time that I can spend on work things, so I'm going to do less work as well because yeah. I have to do that commute. If I can take that and turn it into productive time, why would I be coming into the office? Sure, yeah. Now, there are some benefits to being in person. Um, it's good for building trust. It's good for managing difficult conversations and tricky conflicts. It's good for getting to know a broader range of people than those who we just kind of encounter directly through our work. It's good for mentoring. And so there are definitely some things that we do better in the office. So there are benefits of being um, in the office. There are costs to going to the office. And so I think where we have tended to come out, you know, that ratio looks completely different for different companies and different kinds of work. If the benefits are huge, so if I'm a financial services company where most of my employees are under the age of 30, right? Well, actually a huge amount of what I'm doing is mentoring and training. Sure. And they all, frankly, we're all in New York, so they'll have pretty short commutes. Yeah. Then the idea that actually the benefits of being there in person outweigh the cost, that's plausible. But in most cases, actually, you'll say, given there are benefits and there are costs, we want to bring in people for some purposes. So at the beginning of a project, we should all come together. When we hire new employees, they should be on staff. We want to have some all-hands meetings from time to time yeah. where everybody's here. You want to do that to get those benefits of being in person, but we can get probably 18, 90% of those benefits right. 
while incurring like 10% of the costs right. by only bringing people in once a week, once every two weeks. And so you're seeing, I think, depending on the kind of work people are doing, different ways of balancing those costs and benefits. And I I think to most people, it just seems silly now that kind of you have to be there every day and keep incurring those costs with seriously declining marginal benefits. So off of that, then, where do you think companies' mindset mindsets are right now about their employees, about retaining them, about losing them, because that, you know, go back to 2021 and early 2022, it was a massive concern because you saw such a high level of turnover. The quits rate was, you know, something we hadn't really talked about a lot, uh, but it became a, a monthly concern for so many firms. So as we've hit the end of 2023 and into 2024, where do you think that mindset is? That quit rate's still reasonable. I mean, we're not yet at a place, you know, you're in a deep recession, Frankly, I think when I first started coming in here, kind of, you know, tail end of the Great Recession, you um, you know, you didn't have to worry too much about attrition because it was going to be really hard for your people to get another sure, job. Yeah. We're nowhere near that. And so if you're upset your employees, they're going to leave. And the problem is the people who are most at risk of leaving are the ones who are going to find it easiest to find another job. And so I don't think we're in a situation where most employers can kind of say attrition be damned. Kind yeah. of, we'll we'll just go ahead and do it. And so you want to be you want to be the most attractive employer. You want people to be excited to come to work for you, and you want them to be excited to remain working for you. And given that for most people the flexibility of remote work, the ability to do it at at some point is something that's important to them. It's still. Um, you are handicapping yourself in competing for talent these days if you have a kind of five day in the office policy. How do you think the mindset of either the manager or the C-suite has had to change because of some of these dynamics? I think it's really tricky. You know, I spend a bunch of time talking to CHROs and on this topic, um, it's funny, kind of the first thing that everybody says when they explain their policy is, well, my CEO believes that. Right, right. Um, and part right. of the challenge is, there's not yet a lot of great data on this topic. A huge amount is being driven by CEO beliefs. Um, and they miss the buzz of a full office, right? Sure. There's an excitement there. And again, I'm not saying that um, remote work is costless. Right. But it's about balancing the costs and benefits. And I think they have been, I mean, it varies hugely from organization to organization. There are some CEOs that have really got on board with this and kind of said, this is what we need to do for our talent. It's a new way of working. We can make it work. I think there are a bunch of other CEOs that kind of still vaguely believe if I can't see them working, I'm not sure they actually are. And it's a big mindset shift. A lot of discussion around the issues of mental health and stress, especially in the workplace. How do you think companies have adjusted to that and, and where that potentially is going? It's a great question. It's something that I think we didn't really talk about in a corporate context four or five years ago. Um, I think COVID really brought it to the fore. And so, yeah, it is, wherever you get two or three HR professionals gathered together these days, they'll start talking about mental health. It's it's a huge priority. Um, I think companies are starting to take it very seriously. Sadly, I think the issues are more serious, particularly when you look at kind of the incoming generations. There are these terrifying statistics about how mental health among kind of young people has declined over the last 10 years or so and obviously they're starting to show up in the workplace yeah. um i'm not sure anybody quite knows what to do about it i mean again it, it falls into this conversation it's kind of another dimension of inclusion um another thing you want to be thinking about about how do we manage stress how do we manage burnout so it is clearly a part of the conversation now I'm not sure yet to what extent it's really starting to inform how people manage. So as we turn the calendar to 2024, what are you watching? What are you most interested to keep an eye on in and around careers, labor, workforce? I mean, I think these are these remain the big trends. Um, are we going to see big impacts of AI? Um, again, the evangelists think it's just around the corner. I'm thinking it's in the years until it really starts to um, starts to show up in the labor figures. But I've been proved wrong many times in the past, so I look forward <laughs> to being proved wrong here. Um, I think that's the one everybody wants to talk about. Um, 
we've seen a cooling off in the labor market. Um, what's going on in the economy um, is we've been, again, serially wrong, right? I mean, this time last year, everyone was clear we were going to have a recession in 2023. And we never did. Now everybody's convinced that's a soft landing. We should probably start worrying. <laughs> well, it's just because I'm a died in the wool pessimist, which grow happens if you grow up supporting England. Um, I, if you ask me, is the labour market going to be tighter or looser this time next year? I would probably bet looser, but I think it's just my my pessimism. I think there there downside risks. I think particularly concerning that interest rates will bite over time um but that that'll have a big effect i mean on the other hand i guess you will see um you know the infrastructure bill the inflation reduction act all of those really starting to kick in yeah. as money goes out the door um like i say i think the most encouraging thing about the last three years has been that the big growth has been at the kind of lower end of the wage distribution um, and I think we should continue to see growth, particularly in manufacturing and other blue collar roles. So I think that is that is definitely a positive thing that I hope we'll continue to see over the next over the next year or so. Matthew, always great to chat with you. Thanks very much. Andy, thank you. Matthew Bidwell, professor of management here at the Wharton School.